Well, good evening. My name is Zach Berkowitz and I'm with History Colorado. My office is at El Pueblo History Museum. Uh, tonight's event is part of History Colorado's Borderlands of Southern Colorado online lecture series offered by History Colorado Museums, El Pueblo History Museum, Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, Trinidad History Museum, and the Ute Indian Museum. Before we begin tonight's program, in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. As always, I'd like to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area and Colorado State University Pueblo for their continued support of this series. History Colorado members can deepen their involvement and support of the Borderlands of Southern Colorado initiative by joining Fronteras, the Borderlands of Southern Colorado Society. When you make a contribution by April 8th, you can participate in a special access conversation with Maria Montoya before her talk that evening. You can find more information at h-co.org slash Fronteras. Tonight's talk is a settler colonial state presented by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Roxanne is Professor Emerita of Ethnic Studies at, Cal at Calif uh, California State University Hayward and the author of An Indigenous People's History of the United States, among other books. Uh, we, and we hope you enjoy. Roxanne, welcome. Um, and I am going to stop sharing my screen now so that people can see you better. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you, Jack, uh, Zach, <clears throat> and thanks to Eric, who's helping out. Uh, as you know, I was scheduled to be in Pueblo in person at the El Pueblo Museum, History Museum, last April. But like life itself, the event was canceled. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here finally, uh, remotely. And I um, thank everyone who has joined us. I want, I want to acknowledge that Pueblo, Colorado is part of the, un, the original unceded territory of the Ute Nation. This evening, I'll talk about settler colonialism in the United States. In 2009, soon after he assumed the role as commander in chief of the United States, Barack Obama was interviewed on El Arabi television in Dubai. The interviewer noted that the United States track record on brokering the Israeli-Palestinian situation was not good and asked him if the US would change course and be an honest broker. Affirming that his administration would be an honest broker, Obama said, we sometimes make mistakes. We have not been perfect. But if you look at the track record, as you say, America was not born as a colonial power. He went on to explain that the US itself had been a colony that threw off its colonizer. Of course, this is a false narrative that most US Americans believe. However, European settlers who made up the 13 colonies by ethnically cleansing them and then moving in, and these uh, were, were what was granted independence as the United States were not an oppressed colonized people. They were British citizens being restrained by their monarch from expanding the 13 colonies further into Indian country to enrich themselves. In 1763, the British government created a line on the east side of the Appalachian and Allegheny mountain chain over which British settlers were forbidden to settle. Although during the preceding 150 years, 
British settlers had violently ethnically cleansed the eastern seaboard of its indigenous farmers and fishers, pushing them into the peripheries. The settlers were not allowed to expand farther west. The elite British men who initiated the split with the British Empire and wrote the Constitution were mainly slavers whose wealth depended on acquisition of more land for lucrative non-cash, non-food cash crops, such as tobacco and cotton. They were capitalists and imperialists who verbalized their vision of conquering the entire North American continent to gain access to the Pacific and the wealth of China. So the US was born as a fiscal military state, a state created for war and colonization and imperialism. Achieving their ambitious ambitions required land, wealth, and settler participation. It also required making land available to landless settlers, giving the rights to settlers to violently appropriate Indian villages and fields people out. The founders devised a unique plan manifest in the 1787 Northwest Ordinance. Northwest referred to Northwest of the colonies, that is the Ohio Valley. This ordinance, land ordinance, was created during the War for Independence by the Continental Congress and was reenacted at Independence by the US Congress in 1789. The ordinance was something new under the sun. The constitutional construction of a fiscal military settler state with both ethnic cleansing of the native presence and chattel slavery producing racial capitalism. The Northwest Ordinance provided for eventual settler self-government once European settlers outnumbered the indigenous population. Built into it then was genocide. This land acted, uh, act guaranteed to the settlers property, civil rights, religious freedom, trial by jury, representational legislation, and public education. That ultimate conclusion, however, was preceded by successive stages of colonial development from military ethnic cleansing and control to a federally appointed territorial government to a semi-representational government to finally admission into the United States as a state. Through the Northwest Ordinance, the United States created a unique land system among colonial powers, including Britain. In the US system, land itself, not just what was produced from the land, such as agriculture, mining, logging, grazing, and so on, was the most important exchange commodity, land itself, for the accumulation of capital and building the national treasury. In order to comprehend the apparently irrational genocidal policy of the US government toward the presence of native nations on the land, the centrality of land sales in building the wealth of the settlers and the economic uh, power of the US capital system, capitalist system must be the frame of reference. Anthropologist Patrick Wolf, whose um, work on settler colonialism is quite uh, celebrated and important, he summed up the issue writing that tribal land was tribally owned. Tribes and private property did not mix. Indians were the original communist menace. Whatever settlers may say, 
the primary motive for elimination of the native is not race or religion, ethnicity, grade of civilization, or anything else but access to their land. Territoriality is settler colonialism's specific, irreducible element. However, Patrick Wolf didn't, he's Australian. He didn't quite understand the difference for the US founders between territory and land and the centrality of land as real estate. But he makes a correct point about US American obsession with private property. Regarding the communal nature of native societies, Sen Senator Henry Dawes arguing in the 1880s for allotment of the collectively held indigenous lands said the defect of the reservation system was apparent. It is Henry George's socialist system. And under that, there is no enterprise to make your home any better than that of your neighbors. There is no selfishness, which is at the bottom of civilization. Till this people will content to consent to give up their lands and divide among their citizens so that each of them can own the land he cultivates, they will not make much more progress. And they went ahead and forcibly allotted all of the native land in Oklahoma, in parts of Arizona, Mexico, South Dakota. And it was only stopped with the Red Power Movement uh, in 1974. So private property and land was not invented by the United States. It had, a, had been a long fact in the life in Europe and other parts of the world, but it was demarcated by the contour of streams, rivers, tree lines, rock formations and mountains, and was reserved for the economic and political elite. The United States founders created something new under the sun the Platt system of privatizing land into marketable units, pieces of paper all D. The Northwest Ordinance actually spelled out the process. It spawned the public land survey system, a unique surveying method to Platt, that is divide the land Transform, transforming it into property for sale and settling. Plots of 160 acres was set for plots or 640 acres. As the US took more land with the Louisiana Purchase, the Oregon Territory and half of Mexico taken through war, the government promised free land to Europeans and Euro-Americans for the purpose of recruiting and motivating settlers to squat on indigenous people's lands. Because although they territorially claimed those areas, half of Mexico, the whole um, west of the Mississippi area, they didn't actually possess the land. Indigenous peoples were still there. With indigenous resistance to the squatters, the army would be dispatched. The pieces of paper, the deeds representing units of land, made up the commodity market that built the United States capitalist system and remains its central factor today. You may remember the 2008 um, market crash was based on the, real, the crash of the real estate market. It's still central. The other main commodity until 1860 was human, the enslaved African body with its deed of sale. Historian Donald Harmon 
Akinson aptly describes the implementation of the land ordinance. He writes, it's important, its importance was equal to that of the Constitution of 1787. It did not deal, this is the Northwest Ordinance, it did not deal with, with um, airy concepts such as the pursuit of happiness, but instead declared in practical terms how the land from the Appalachian Mountains up to the Mississippi River was to be conquered. This was to be done by surveyors' chains, each 22 yards in length. The measuring began at an arbitrary point in the Ohio Territory, and invisible lines were drawn on the land to form a grid of perfect triangles marked by cairns, iron bars, and the occasional brass plate cemented onto a masonry base. Each of the rectangles had its own map reference. And as the US Imperium expanded, the grid eventually reached the Pacific coast and stretched between Mexico and British North America. The lines on the land not only conquered natural topography, but also made possible the liberation of parcels of land from their previous occupants and their efficient allocation to newcomers. So that is settler colonialism. It was also the implementation of the fiscal military state. All of this was done by war. And it was the state made for war in order to appropriate property. From the beginning of surveys in the newly claimed Northwest Territory, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, the lands claimed by the surveys were already populated with indigenous peoples, but the land was treated as terra nullius, unpopulated land, while the indigenous nations and communities were reduced in numbers by genocidal warfare that caused displacement, starvation, crowded refugee situations, and resultant infectious diseases, and were forced onto army-guarded concentration camps dependent on government rations. The indigenous peoples of the large native agricultural nations of the South were forcibly relocated to west of the Mississippi. This is important for understanding not only how settler colonialism defines the United States and all its institutions, but also as African historian Mahmoud Mandami has documented that all of the defining institutions of settler colonialism as practiced in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries were first developed by the United States. The United States tribal homeland was a prototype, not only for the South American, South African reserve under apartheid, but also the Nazi concentration camp. But it wasn't only slavers driving the land grabs and real estate commodity market. During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln did not forget his free soiler base who brought him to that high office. Free soil meant free of chattel slavery for white commercial farmers like Lincoln's family who could not afford to purchase enslaved bodies and therefore could not compete with slavers on the market. Congress, at Lincoln's behest, passed the Homestead Act in 1862, as well as the Morrill Act, the latter transferring large tracts of indigenous land to the states to establish land-grant universities. The Pacific Railroad Act provided private companies with nearly 200 million acres of indigenous land. 
With these massive land grabs, the U.S. government broke multiple treaties with indigenous nations whose people were still living there. And during the Civil War, there was an outbreak of the, the, the Dakotas who were defending themselves in Minnesota from um, the white Scandinavian settlers who were allowed to go there and take their land. And that ended in the mass ex execution, the largest mass execution in the history of the United States, the Dakotas who were rounded up. So the entire uh, project would take genocidal military force to evict the native people. Most of the Western territories, including Colorado, North and South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona, were delayed in achieving statehood because indigenous nations resisted appropriation of their lands and outnumbered the settlers until they didn't. So the colonization plan for the West established during the Civil War was carried over, out over the following three decades of war and land grabs. The old Northwest Territory the Ohio Territory was the initial site of genocidal policy enacted by the founders of the United States. By the time of the War of Independence that created the United States, British settlers and armed white citizen militias had 170 years of experience in ethnically cleansing and dominating the 13 original British colonies. Employing this intergenerationally practiced and unlimited war against civilians and their resources, the government and settlers intensified and accelerated these practices from 1787 to 1832 in the invasion and conquest of the densely populated Ohio country which comprised the future states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. The genocidal campaigns carried out by the new US Army were resisted by a confederation of, uh, of many different confederations of indigenous nations. But by 1803, ethnically cleansed Ohio became a state followed by Indiana. 13 years later, and the others following. The next period of the US, the army under Andrew Jackson pursued genocidal wars in the South against the Muscogees and the Cherokees and the Seminoles in Spanish Florida, where the US Marines and army mounted three major wars against the Seminole nation between 1816 and 1858, albeit without succeeding in removing the Seminole people who remain there today, except for a few who uh, went to uh, Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And when Jackson was president in the 1830s, he ordered in the, uh, the forced removal of all the native people from east of the Mississippi. Where I grew up in Oklahoma, which had been Indian territory, there are 52 representatives of 52 different native nations, only about six of them indigenous to that territory. All the rest were um, removed from the east. Not everyone left. They simply had no rights as native people or any land east of the Mississippi, but they're now reconstituting themselves uh, also east of the Mississippi. During the Civil War, the Union Army forced the removal and four year incarceration of the Navajos, resulting in the death of half their population. 
And during the same time, the Dakota Nation was forced by the Union Army out of their homeland in Minnesota, while unarmed Northern Cheyenne were massacred in their reservation at Sand Creek in Colorado. After the Civil War, six of the seven divisions of the U.S. Army were stationed west of the Mississippi, where they carried out genocidal wars against the Plains and Southwestern uh, indigenous nations, including the intentional extermination of tens of millions of bison in order to starve the peoples of the bison. Those troops had been pulled out of the South, the former Confederacy, where they were supposed to be occupying the defeated um, Confederate states to allow for land distribution to former enslaved people and for their political participation in democratic elections. Without sufficient U.S. Army troops to stop them, the Ku Klux Klan made reconstruction impossible, imp imposing a reign of terror and restored the ex-Confederate elite, a brutal segregation regime that was not broken until a century later, although sometimes it seems they actually took over um, a good part of the United States, the presidency of, Ronald, of Donald Trump, certainly. The Wild West originated in the Northwest Territory in the Ohio country, east of the Mississippi, not in the West. Defining the West as the site of genocidal conquest erases its origins at the very founding of the British colonies and subsequent founding of the United States, when and where its leaders were intent on building world power based on land theft, genocide, and slavery, the pillars of the U.S. fiscal military state. It is essential to understand that aggressive white nationalism and settler colonialism form bedrock of United States institutions and historical and continuing white nationalism, a culture of violence, a gun culture, a militaristic culture. And the genocidal policy toward indigenous nations and descendants of enslaved Africans always looms inside the US and has been extended globally by US policies and wars in the Pacific and the Caribbean, including Central America, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and increasingly in Africa. A kind of innocence characterizes the erasure of continued settler colonialism. Romanticizing settler sovereignty is a way of erasing colonialism and indigenous nations and is a tendency as much on the left or liberal spectrum as the right or the conservative. Just as John F. Kennedy's book, A Nation of Immigrants, ushered in a new liberal era, so too did his romantic rhetoric about settlers as he reached the presidency. In accepting his nomination at the 1960 Democratic presidential candidate as the Democratic presidential candidate in Los Angeles, he said, I stand tonight here in Los Angeles facing west on what was once the last frontier from the lens that stretched 3,000 miles behind me, the pioneers of old gave up their safety, their comfort, and sometimes their lives to build a new world here in the West. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier. Echoing Kennedy in an attempt to revive frayed liberalism, Barack Obama in his 2009 presidential inaugural address also romanticized settlers 
even including enslaved Africans as settlers. He said, in reaffirming the greatness Well, I lost in reaffirming the greatness of this country, we have to honor those who trekked west, the pioneers, some with the under the lash of the whip. So and then he said, they endured the lash of the whip and plowed the hard earth. For us, they fought and died in places like Concord and Gettysburg, Normandy, and Quezon, which is Vietnam. Settler colonialism is in the present. As Alyosha Goldstein observes, it is not a relic of the past, but a historical condition remade at particular moments of conflict in the service of securing certain privileges and often to symbolically negotiate inequalities among white people. Criticizing the erasure of native peoples in the United States, African writer Mahmoud Bandami observes Engaging with the native question would require questioning the ethics and the politics of the very constitution of the United States of America. It would require rethinking and reconsidering the very political project called the USA. Indeed, it would call into question the self-proclaimed anti-colonial identity of the US highlighting the colonial nature of the American political project would require a deep shift in the understanding of America, one necessary to think through both America's place in the world and the task of political reform for future generations. So this is the ch challenge I leave you with. Try to think about how that might be done, how we can change a settler state into a democratic republic with land restored to native peoples, all the federal lands, all the land taken without treaty, taken illegally so they could build, build up their nations again and thrive and even be a motor for the rest of the country. Try to think beyond the boundaries that are presented to us. And um, this, may, this may be life or death, whether or not the planet itself can survive the United States and if the rest of the peoples of the world can survive. So we have a lot of responsibility here in the United States. And I think, uh, I think we should be up to it and we should be able to, um, to really be energized and think about what we could do. So I would love to have questions and also just uh, not just questions to me, but even proposals of how you think that might be done, how change might come about. Thank you. Roxanne, thank you so much um, for that. We, we do have some good questions getting started in the chat. And um, please, if you have um, questions for Roxanne, um, drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. The first one is from Bill Redmond. Um, he asks, he says, I would love to hear the professor's thoughts on the recent Supreme Court, Supreme Court ruling, McGirt v. Oklahoma, ruling that the eastern portion of the state of Oklahoma remains as Native American reservations of the five civilized tribes. And if there are other similar situations where that really might grant some relief to other tribes. Well, it's, um, 
you know, first of all, it applied only to the Muscogee Creek uh, people, not the whole uh, of all, all of Eastern Oklahoma, although that, that's Tulsa, Oklahoma and a large area around it. It's no longer even, um, you know, it was allotted, completely allotted. Uh, but the Oklahoma state government, uh, of course, has intervened and it's, um, it's pretty much up in the air. And I don't think there's really a lot of, um, I think it's coming to be seen as a, um, as a, uh, a, a statement of, of something that it can't be implemented without actual U.S. Uh, congressional Congress is in charge of uh, all Indian affairs, the federal government is, and without acts of Congress, nothing can change. So it's more like a, uh, uh, I don't know, a kind of almost a throwaway, almost a, a cynical. Um, the only thing positive about it was that I think it, it it made the headlines in such a way that um, people who didn't even know the Muscogee existed or that they had lost, you know, uh, illegally lost the land. Um, so they, you know, became aware of that and probably think it's all been restored because, you know, it. Um, and so there's no problem there anymore. So really, nothing has really come of it. And the state government of Oklahoma is putting up every possible barrier imaginable to, um, and of course, their, their delegation in Congress um, working behind the scenes that there should not be. But on the positive side, um, President uh, Biden appointed uh, Deb Holland as Secretary of Interior. This is, uh, was actually mind blowing. It was the DSA people, um, Bernie Sanders, that, you know, some of their bargain, bargaining chips, the $15 an hour um, for a minimum for workers and uh, many other things that um, they made demands in order to, uh, to co cooperate with Biden uh, Biden's administration, and one was to select Deb Holland uh, as Secretary of Interior. So it was a great surprise that it happened. She's a Laguna Pueblo woman. The Pueblos in New Mexico, you probably know something about them. They're very, um, they're very knowledgeable, still practicing their, their rituals, live in their Pueblos. Um, they were colonized by the Spanish and resisted for 300 years, uh, once completely threw the Spanish out and are a very, you know, um, she's, she's a, a, a deeply Pueblo grassroots um, uh, product and um, she knows her stuff. How, how she can deal with the oil and gas industry and the coal mining and the cattle barons is a question, but she can at least um, uh, provide more resources to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is under the Department of Interior, the Indian Health Service. Um, she can do a lot in four years and hopefully eight years. And um, uh, the sacred sites that were removed by uh, Trump have, have already been restored. So she may also intervene in the uh, Gert case. Um, we'll see if uh, she can play a role. Um, but it, you know, it is a, uh, it was a surprise and, you know, that Republican um, uh, who, who was the swing vote with the liberals on it is, he is very knowledgeable. He's one of the very few, I mean, none, none of them on the Supreme Court except him, have any knowledge whatsoever of Indian affairs. The worst was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, she actually wrote the, what well, was a unanimous decision 
in um, 2000, 2008 um, on the uh, Oneida, um, on the Oneida case of, uh, um, not the Oneida, another, um, anyway, a, a land case that uh, she, uh, she actually voted, you know, uh, was very much against um, the the land claim uh, land claims and invoked the doctrine of discovery, the doctrine of discovery, the Catholic Church's um, original doctrine of you know of Columbus discovering America and by discovery owning everything. So a very reactionary decision, but they simply are uninformed like the rest of the American public. So it is refreshing to have at least one person on the Supreme Court who, who does have some knowledge of, of Indian, of native, native land issues. We've got a question from Allison who asks, for those of us living in 2021, how do we repay those indigenous people upon whose land we live? Not money, land back. That that is the that is the rallying call of Native people today. Land back. You will see that. If you start noticing, you will see that sign and that image in many places. Land back. That's the demand, and that's not reparations. That's restitution. It was taken illegally. So all of the federal lands, the national park lands, all of it was taken illegally. National park lands are the most sacred lands of, of the relevant native people. Um, and, uh, and also the restoration of the Black Hills, which of course is, is um, where Mount Rushmore is. So those are the, you know, that that's, that's it. It's a very, very simple equation, land back. And it would not disturb any uh, person's lives. It would simply be native people being stewards of the public lands rather than um, cattle barons <laughs> and miners and, uh, and gas uh, industry. Uh, leasing the lands and destroying them. So that's an end for each native nation. There's a, you know, the land that was allotted um, for the restoration of territories, you know, where they actually have room to grow and flourish and build towns and, um, and infrastructure that doesn't exist now on the reservations. But they would still be living under the colonial system. Native people uh, don't own, uh, you know, they, if they own allotments, they own little pieces of land. But they're, it's called a trusteeship. The United, they're as if they are children or um, mentally incapable. Uh, the federal government is the trustee of Native people. So, uh, they don't actually have full sovereignty, and um, that's what is needed to is full sovereignty. And where they would have that actual choice if they wanted to be an independent country, like the Navajo Nation population is, is greater than about 30 different uh, member states of the United Nations. It could very easily be an independent nation. So if we can think of a future topography or geography that is, is not just static of what the United States says it is now, I think we free ourselves of, uh, of um, you know, uh, hopelessness that nothing is possible. Thank you for that. Um, Bonnie asks, 
how do you feel about the use of indigenous land acknowledgements as a starting point in countering erasure? Well, I certainly do it. Um, I think it's, um, and I'm on, I'm on Ohlone, uh, unceded Ohlone land in the San Francisco Bay Area. I think it's a good practice. It's a, um, it's fairly new. And uh, I think it came from, you know, from uh, initiatives of Native people uh, that, that it was the appropriate thing to do. It, when people are preparing for something, if they don't know, we're like when I travel around the country, I don't always know what Native people were uh, in a particular place. So I have to, I have to look it up. I have to study it. And, you know, then by the time I'm there, I, I know whose original land I'm on. So I think it has a good effect. Um, and, uh, and as, you know, it, um, it it may it may seem uh, ritualistic, but ritual is not a bad thing. Pilar asks, "What's been your experience with re-educating academics, politicians, and activists about the current received history of the United States?" And what are those of us on who are on the Zoom to do? I myself am a person whose grandparents' generation were detribalized in boarding schools. Um, well, the boarding schools had <clears throat> or were uh, absolutely a horrible effect on on generations of Native people. On um, there's intergenerational trauma from people having their children taken away from them, forcibly taken away, and um, in most cases, uh, put in boarding schools far, far away. So visitations were impossible or, or certainly not frequent and um, forced to speak English, um, do away with all their, you know, any, any, um, um, piercing, earrings, uh, regalia, uh, dress like, uh, dress like Americans and haircut. Um, and, um, and, and really uh, militarized, especially the boys, but many of the, the uh, you know, the young women went into the military too. Native people still are the, um, and until 1923, uh, when Native people, 24, when Native people were forcibly made citizens of the United States, they could not be um, drafted and they still can't be. There was a case they can't be drafted because of their Native status. But they still volunteer and die in greater numbers, a greater percentage than any other group in the United States. There's that militarization that came from the <clears throat> boarding schools. I mean, some of it is just purely economic, you know, joining the military is the only option sometimes just to make a living um, and be able to support the family or the community. But it also is a psychological effect of militarism. And um, yeah, but um, yeah, detribalized, I'm not sure, because people, you know, families did stay in touch. I mean, many, many people, when they went back home, say at 16 or 17, if they went back home, Sometimes they stayed where they were and did get completely separated from the families, but most, I think, went back to their families. But by then they would have missed all of the stages of, um, of rituals and uh, initiations that all the tribes have. They're not alike, they're all, you know, all very different, unique, but a process 
for both the boys and girls. They will have missed all that, plus not speaking the language, being alienated. Um, so sometimes they go back and then they leave again because of that. So it's a very, you know, it's it, it was really a, a very intentional. Uh, you know, when I use the term genocide, I'm referring to the the UN Convention on um, the prevention uh, and prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. And one of the um, acts of genocide that a, a country, a state can be responsible for is removing children from their families. Uh, so it's clear, clearly um, a genocidal effect that Native people um, experienced. So I'm not sure I answered what the question was, though. Did I answer it, the question or just start talking? <laughs> uh, the one little bit of question there um, to still address is, uh, like, what's your experience with re-educating academics or politicians or activists? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I was avoiding that question. <laughs> um, the you know, I, I didn't have much hope for for that until I published a, an Indigenous Peoples History of the United States in 2014. And somehow this, you know, one, um, a friend of mine, uh, John Kane, a Seneca friend who has a radio program in um, WBAI in, in New York City, he calls that book uh, One Stop Shopping, um, that it, um, it has everything in it, you know, in a concise way. And um, I wrote it with that intention, but I had no idea how, how much it would be embraced, especially by librarians and teachers. Um, just overwhelming. Uh, but I also by some politicians and um, um, influencers of various sorts. Um, uh, and um, it's it's still going on, you know. I mean, I thought, okay, this is this. It started immediately. The first edition, I mean, the first printing, sold out um, before I got to New York on my book tour. I had three places to stop, and when I got to New York, the whole first printing had already sold out, and not because of the talks I was giving. It just seemed to um, it just seemed to fill a spot that was waiting to be filled. You know, it's it's mysterious how these things work. Um, but it has, I think, um, been a vehicle that's made me see how much um, people can change their thinking in a short time, uh, because I have been invited. Um, until, you know, until the pandemic shut down, I was traveling, you know, four or five places a week around the country, talking, um, very large um, gatherings, and to lots of librarians and, and teachers. And, and then the book came out um, in 2018 in a young people's edition, and that gave a whole new I didn't write the end, uh, I didn't adapt it. Some brilliant Debbie Reese and Jean um, Mendoza adapted it. It's a wonderful adaptation. And um, so then K to 12, you know, teachers really embraced it. And it won every award imaginable in children and young people's book prizes at the end of uh, 2000. Uh, 19 it came out in 2019 so it's been encouraging um and um what it will i um but it's it's not just my book in fact my book couldn't have been done even in the year 2000 because the you know native um native young people who have um become historians, anthropologists, sociologists, uh, cultural studies, uh, literature, and become professors in major universities. Phil Deloria is now at 
at um, uh, Harvard and um, and you know really a presence and publishing articles and essays and poetry and literature and um, history books. I, I couldn't have written that book without that um, without that body of knowledge and, and material that and since then, since 2014, it's quadrupled that, you know, that production. So I think there, you know, it, uh, it has made a big difference and will continue to even in greater, uh, greater numbers of, you know, in the pipeline or just thousands of brilliant young native uh, scholars in the making. Uh, archaeologists and and um, uh, um, there's a whole new field called uh, native knowledge um, that Greg Cajete uh, from New Mexico Pueblo um, had created all his own and it, you know I, I happened into I was going to a conference and I thought I was at the right place and because it was a conference going on and it, it was really big. I was going to an oral history conference and I didn't recognize anyone, you know, usually because I, you know, you get to know people. And so I asked, I said, is this an oral history conference? I said, no, this is a native knowledge conference. I said, oh my God. As I knew Greg Cajete was, you know, working on that, but I didn't know there was this very large um, association that had developed. So, it, so that's an, uh, you know, really interesting field, and included in it is native science. So I think um, I think changes are coming, and as people understand this, you know, they, I think it's it. it you know, it's such an ugly history, the history of the United States and and the lies that are told, but it's actually very liberating. I think uh, there's something about the truth that just has a, uh, I don't know, a refreshing effect, even if it's, if it's hard to take um, uh, and um, sometimes feeling very dumb not to have gotten it before, but there's really no way um, people in this country can learn these things, uh, it, you know, in, in the recent past. I don't really hold people that responsible because it's just not taught. In fact, so many lies are told that, you know, it's not just finding the facts or finding the truth, but unspooling, you know, the uh, narrative that exists. And that's really hard to do as an individual, unless you, you know, even people who go through graduate school, um, unless they focus on this, they don't get any of this. There are people with PhDs and medical doctors and psychiatrists and, you know, really bright, knowledgeable, liberal people who haven't the faintest idea of the reality of U.S. history. Well, Roxanne, thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, and for sharing your amazing insights and uh, really captivating talk. So, and thank you to all of you who um, tuned in this evening. We are aware that there are some, there's an issue with our ticketing system that uh, some folks got the wrong link to start. Um, we will uh, fix that for the next one and, and um, there will be a private link for, um, to rewatch this uh, that will get out very soon. Um, the next Borderlands talk uh, in the series is Thursday, April 8th. Uh, it's at 6 p.m., same time on Zoom with Maria Montoya. Uh, and Fronteras members, as I mentioned at the beginning, can um, there will be a, a conversation beforehand, a, a sort of meet and greet with Maria Montoya.
before her talk on April 8th. Um, and you can get tickets to that at h-co.org slash borderlands talks. You can find more information about our um, Fronteras membership, the Borderlands of Southern Colorado Society uh, at h-co.org slash Fronteras. Um, so we hope you'll um, take a look at becoming a member of that. If you're interested um, in uh, Roxanne's book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, there's a link here, h-co.org slash indigenous people's history. That'll take you to our History Colorado bookshop um, and purchases you make there um, support History Colorado. Um, and then there's also, um, uh, we have a Borderlands bundle in our e-store uh, with a, a book and a t-shirt. Um, and for tonight and tomorrow, uh, there's a, a coupon if you follow that link. That's the same address, h-co.org slash borderlands bundle. Um, we want to thank again the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, Colorado State University Pueblo, and to all of our donors and members for supporting public programs at History Colorado Community Museums. Um, again, Roxanne, uh, all of the viewers, thank you so much, and um, have a good evening.